Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Today from the US Chamber of Commerce office in Washington DC, and a very warm welcome to all of you to the first Transatlantic Growth Roundtable in 2022. I have been so honored when Alice, Emma, Sophie and the wider team asked me to do this today because I'm a big fan of their work and most importantly of all the companies and colleagues that we are acknowledging as part of the transatlantic growth campaign. For those who don't know me, my name is Emmanuel Adam and I'm the Chief Policy and Trade Officer working for British American Business. And as I mentioned today, calling out of the US Chamber Office in Washington, DC. For those who don't know exactly what transatlantic growth is, um, this is indeed a very important initiative to British American Business. Um, as an organization, we are of course, committed to helping companies grow and invest across the Atlantic. And what TAG, Transatlantic Growth, does is it highlights and acknowledges stories that we found in the previous year of companies who have turned their transatlantic ambition into reality. So every year we look into new stories and company announcements and things that we find on social media and we pick you know, a very big list of companies. And then we look at it and think, okay, well, here are a couple of stories that really stand out and those companies should be acknowledged. And then these companies are being added to the tag campaign. One thing to note is that we don't only look at numbers, um, but we are also looking behind the scene, behind the numbers at the individual stories of those companies. So that means that we really embrace and reflect the full diversity of company stories. You know, it doesn't really matter whether you're big or small, whether you have you know, created lots of jobs or whether you have um, increased your exports and therefore increased your footprint in the US. We really try to look into you know, what is the product, what is the story behind it, um, and then try to build up a nice mix and diversity for every year's tag list. The campaign, um, and we have now, and I would have to check with my colleagues, I think we're in the fourth year or so, um, could not take place without our partners and sponsors this year from HSBC, Delta Airlines and Virgin Atlantic. And I would like, really like to use a moment to say a big thanks to their continued to support, their commitment since the very beginning in making this initiative work. Because, you know, it is, it is so important that we have those companies support our program, but they also reflect what is extremely important for the quarter, which is that you need partners who help you turn, as I said, your uh, ambition into reality. Um, so, which is why it's great that we have them with us today also, and I will offer them the floor in a moment to say a few words. In terms of logistics, we have about an hour. We will have um, comments from our partners um, first, and then what we would try to do is, um, as colleagues have just come in, I would like to offer the floor to a number of companies that we have acknowledged in our campaign and colleagues will later on share the list of companies so you can see which company has been acknowledged for what. And I will ask them a few questions and let them introduce themselves so that you get a flavor of, you know, what is the company do and why did they end up on the tag tracker? And if you have a question, um, feel free to put that in the chat or send it to me directly. Um, depending on time, we may have colleagues come in. And um, we have a fairly large group of, of, of um, colleagues on the call today, I think. Um, so I will see how we can manage that. But um, please feel free to make yourself known and heard, and we'll bring you in. But as I said, my focus in the beginning will be to have companies and company representatives speak who have been acknowledged as part of the campaign. Um, this is the first, and that's the final comment before I hand over, the first of uh, a number of uh, roundtables to come. And there will also be a reception, which I will we'll mention later on. Here we go. So with that, I have done my first bit and I would now like to welcome and hand over to Cora McLaren, who is the Managing Director and Head of International Subsidiary Banking at HSBC, a strong, a big friend and supporter of this initiative for a few welcoming remarks. Cora, over to you. Emmanuel, thank you so much. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from sunny London today. So we really are pan transatlantic. Uh, I am delighted to be here on behalf of HSBC uh, and our friends at British American Business supporting the Transatlantic Growth um, Roundtable this afternoon. Through the series and beyond, I've seen British American Business do a fabulous job in providing the forum for businesses on both sides of the Atlantic to connect and to continue building those all important relationships. As Emmanuel said in his opening comments, partnerships are absolutely vital. 
And so it's important to recognize and celebrate the companies. We're going to hear some fabulous stories and uh, some really heroic outcomes this afternoon. And uh, not only embracing opportunities in UK US trade corridor, but in growing, investing and employing more colleagues. In supporting this growth, we are creating jobs, we're fostering innovation, and we're contributing to much needed economic prosperity. The US was the UK's largest trading partner in 2021, and the two countries share over $1 trillion of foreign direct investment with each other. Even in the light of uncertainty caused by current events, the fundamentals remain compelling when it comes to growth opportunities for UK companies expanding into the US. At HSBC, I believe we're well placed to support companies looking to explore these opportunities. And it goes without saying that the UK US trading relationship has endured for many years and will be more important than ever in the years to come. I know we're in for a fabulous time this afternoon. I'm always going to be upstaged by someone whose job title is Chief Frog. So I did just bring a little someone along with me. It's going to be another uh, excellent session. So thanks again for your time this afternoon. I really hope you enjoy the session and I wish you every success personally and professionally. Emmanuel, thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. And actually two things I'm, I forgot to mention earlier is, is that what you just mentioned, Carl, this is also about forming a network. So if colleagues are interested to link up with each other after the event, during the event, feel free to get in touch with our team. We would be very happy to make that work. And also don't forget, this event is not just a standalone initiative. We will and would love to be your partner down the line, whether it be tomorrow, in a week, or in a month, or in a year from now. So hopefully we can really build a long-lasting relationship that helps your company be successful in the US or whatever that is. Um, with that, handing over now to Roy Egan Thomas, who's the global SME lead for Virgin Atlantic. That Virgin Atlantic has a global SME lead speaks for itself. Roy, we would love to know what it is that you do there. Roy, over to you. Thanks, Emmanuel. And um, yes, good morning to everyone over in the States and uh, good afternoon to everyone here in the UK and uh, wherever else you may be. Um, Virgin Delta, we're very much delighted to be part of the Transatlantic Growth Tracker for 2022. To be here and talking about expansion, growth and people being on the move is really a far cry from where we were this time in 2020. Um, back then, at this period, we went 90 days without actually carrying any passengers. So to be here and talking about growth and, ex and expansion is fantastic. The US borders have been open since last November uh, and the last six months have seen a huge rebound in people traveling, whether that's for long awaited holidays, seeing friends and relatives, and of course, for business. We've seen constant growth across all of our corporate segments and in April, our levels of recovery are at 80% versus what we saw in 2019. So it does show that things are heading in the right direction. Our summer program is fully operational now. So we have a full roster of destinations operating between the UK and the US. Washington and Seattle came online at the end of March, and we look forward to welcoming Austin to the network, which launches in two weeks time with a full times weekly rotation. July will see us to continue to grow and expand. We welcome our newest aircraft to the fleet. Now, if there are any aviation enthusiasts out there, I'm happy to talk about this offline, but we welcome the newest A330-900 aircraft, another new modern twin-engined aircraft, very light, very fuel efficient, which will only continue to make Virgin's fleet the youngest in the skies. In conjunction with our partner, Delta Airlines, we look forward to hearing more about you and your stories, growth into the US, and we can hope you'll be your, hopefully be your airline partnership of choice to take you to our gateways and beyond. Thank you so much, Roy, for your opening remarks. And I would actually like to stay with you, if I, if I may, because Virgin Atlantic has also been acknowledged in this year's TAC campaign. Um, Looking at my colleagues, I think for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, and for very good reason, um, and I would love to learn and kick off with you and learn more about this. Before I do that, though, I was I was trying just now to post a picture into the chat, which I, I saw did not work, am I right? I, I cannot share a picture, but I just wanted to, to echo what you just said, how important it was to reopen the Transatlantic Corridor. And Virgin Atlantic was actually the airline that brought me and my family back to London um, after the corridor was open again, after the second wave hit us, um, we were, you know, unfortunately among the only passengers on the plane, but your team took very well care of us and our um, one-year-old son and brought us safely back to the UK. And um, it was just 
uh, a great example of how you continue to fly even though the planes were empty and had to fly empty in order to just keep the corridor open until we were actually able to fully reopen the corridor again. So thanks on behalf of the entire community for what you have done and thanks now for your achievement. And because the reason why you ended up on the tag list was because you were among the early, the, the early airlines or one of the airlines that started very early on in reopening direct roads between the UK and different US destinations. Um, so it would be great to get a feel from you. Um, um, what is it that kept you going? And how, what is it that makes you so com com confident about the corridor? You were really, as I said earlier, in reopening those routes, including to, um, if I'm Austin, Texas, that was it, Austin, Texas, quite early on. Over to you again, Rory. Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. I'm glad you uh, had a great flight with us when we brought you back. Um, Back when the pandemic was at its height, but um, yeah, I mean, for Virgin Atlantic, there's no, there's no um, Virgin Atlantic without the Atlantic, right? I mean, eighty percent of our business is operating um, from the UK to the US. Um, you know, we've got very well established routes, you know, to the main um, gateways on the East Coast from Boston all the way down to Miami, and on the West Coast, um, you know, with San Francisco, LA, Seattle, um, you know, being really key destinations for us. But one area where we haven't really operated before is that middle part of the country. Now we work very well with Delta with our connectivity over um, all of the hubs. So with one-stop operations into a lot of these other other cities, but Austin for us has been a place that's been on the map um, or the roadmap for, for a while. COVID did put a bit of a pause on that for us. But when you look at the city and you look at the type of businesses it's attracting, it is bringing in some of those larger operations like Apple, um, coupled with the SME scene that it has, um, in, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Austin, um, but they have a thing called Keep It Weird. Um, the airport, for example, is just fully, um, uh, all the businesses within the airport are all small, independent, local um, companies. They're not the big national chains you'd see at other, other airports. So taking those things in, throwing on top South by Southwest Festival, you've got the US Grand Prix um, and the leisure business that goes on top. Um, the Silicon Hills area of Austin and San Antonio was really something that was quite appealing for us. So um, we're really very much looking forward to, to starting the operation later this month. We see it as a, a route that will benefit Virgin um, both ways with strong points of sale in the US as well as the UK. So um, it's been a while since we've added a new US destination. Seattle would have been our last Virgin operated route back in 2017. So to, to add Austin to that roster and have that first direct flight into the middle of the US and the type of city that it is in terms of uh, the various businesses that are based there is really exciting. Thank you so much. Good luck. And please continue to be on that journey, literally. Um, for many companies, it is extremely valuable if there is a direct connection between a UK destination and a US destination. And today, today we are foc focusing on UK into the US growth. And when you look at the numbers, even though we still have to recover from the pandemic, when you actually look at new initiatives, new projects, UK companies are leading when it comes to the US counterparts, which means that the U UK companies have started much earlier um, turning their projects that had been maybe on hold for a while into reality. So see, we see a lot of traffic, and I think many colleagues on the call will um, resonate that the more direct connections we have, the easier it will be for colleagues to get to the place they will be. And it's not only doesn't only always have to be New York or San Francisco, as good as, as these places are. So thank you so much. And we uh, look forward to uh, flying with you to those new destinations. Staying with travel and turning to bikes, um, frog, bind, frog bikes. Jerry, I have to admit, not only do you guys have great titles, as we just learned from Cora, um, but it is very possible that we have come across you before a few years back. And it may have been through the U.S. Embassy or through some regional engagement that we did. There may have also been a regulatory question that we may have looked at together. In any case, it is so good to have you back and it's so good to have you on the tag list and congratulations for your expansion to the U.S. As I said earlier, I'm calling from the U.S. right now and I'm not surprised that this is an important market for you. Um, the bike market is indeed booming over here. So it would be interesting to see what your mission is when it comes to the U.S. and maybe also how it has been over the past two years, because I know it was not easy to get your bikes over here. And so it would be quite interesting to know where do you plan to manufacture your bikes? What is your uh, key market? And maybe if you have a second at the very end, give me a recomm recommendation for a good bike for a two-year-old, because I did browse your website and uh, I saw some fantastic products there. So I'm always happy to take a good recommendation for you. Um, Jerry Lawson um, from Chief, Chief Rock, from Rock Bikes, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And, and you've, you've asked so many questions, I don't know where to start. So probably the first thing to say is we manufacture lightweight kids' bikes. Um, we've been around since 2013. We now manufacture in our own site in Wales and we employ about 100 people. So we're in a different space to a lot of manufacturers of bikes. We're actually manufacturing in the country. Um, in the UK, there's two other manufacturers that do it. One is well-known Brompton, um, who manufacture the same sort of volume, but their prices are very different. Um, we launched, you're absolutely right, we launched in the US in 2016 with the help of the US Embassy. So we spent a lot of time looking at it, talking it through, analyzing and going, we're ready to do it. For us, going in the US was a big thing. Most other markets we sort of fell into because there were enthusiastic people who wanted bikes for their kids. The US, we actually went into strategically, which was a bit different. Um, we are selling in about 250 stores in the US. Um, there's about 5,000 bike shops. So we've got a big opportunity. We probably want to be in 1,000. We're in 600 in the UK. So the opportunity for us is big. If we look at the size of the market, 3 million kids' bikes are sold in the US a year. So we are still in our infancy. Um, but the pandemic, you talked about the pandemic. We had our ups and downs. Absolutely fantastic. Lockdown everywhere. All the team sports stopped, no swimming, no tennis. Everybody got on their bikes. Absolutely fantastic for us making kids' bikes. The difficulty is some of the key well-known brands of component manufacturers, let's use Shimano, couldn't keep up with demand. Um, so we sold out. So it was a cracking pandemic to start with. We sold everything we had in our warehouse. Then we didn't have anything left to sell and everything we were manufacturing went out the door. Um, yeah. Things have sort of changed a little bit. Um, we're now manufacturing and we're back to stock levels, which is really good for our global expansion. We're in about 50 countries now. Um, but still, what we want to do in the US, we're still in our infancy. So we've still got a lot more to do there. Back to your specific question about your kid's bike. The answer is, the only answer is a frog bike. And <laughs> you need to go to your local store and measure it or look on our website and measure your kid's inside leg. It's going to be a balanced bike because I assume they've not ridden before. Yeah. Just understanding the inside leg, we will have a balanced bike. And if the team don't have it in the US, we've got it uh, in the UK. So our model in the US is we have a team with a warehouse and then we've got a, about eight guys on the road visiting stores. We need to get that to about 20 guys visiting stores, but we are um, getting there. Um, and we work with independent bike stores. So all our development of the bike and all the team that do research and development is all about selling through independent bike stores yeah. who then have a great relationship with the local stores, uh, local customers. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. And we look forward to having even more bikes from you over, over there. And it's great to hear how they are being manufactured in Wales. And uh, I think four quick comments. Um, First, I will send you a picture once we have a bike at home and my son is riding it. Uh, second, um, you mentioned uh, something really, really important, which is that the U.S. Embassy in London does indeed provide invaluable support to companies who want to expand to the U.S. and invest in the U.S. Brenda von Horn from the commercial team is on the call. She and her colleagues have a wide range of offerings to companies who are interested in making that work. If you don't know about it, use the chance to connect. And as I said earlier, we as a British American business team are always happy to help you navigate the support system that's available out there. Um, third point is, as part of their work, they're currently bringing companies and encouraging companies to attend the Select USA Summit that will take place late June in Washington, D.C. It's a fantastic opportunity to meet pretty much people from all over the U.S. in one place and learn about different places, where to go, where to sell, um, who can potentially help. The U.S. Embassy will go there and British American business will also be there. And we are also looking at a pro, um, building a little bit of delegation that we can then um, help um, on the ground once they are here. And then the fourth point is something that British American business also does, especially since Jerry just explained his model and how he tries to expand in the U.S., British American business has a, a series of accelerate roundtables, which are pretty much a best practice session supported by JetBlue. I see Maya on the call on the call here too. It's a great series where we always invite people like Jerry and others who just report out on how did it go, what went well, what didn't go well, who did help, and what was the system. It's really good to learn from those co colleagues in addition to the support system that, for example, HSBC, BAB, the Chem, uh, US, uh, US Embassy or others provide. So just a, four, uh, just a number of quick comments and then I'm done. And because I want to hand over to the third 
colleague now. I saw Lee Rassling on the call, who is the business and project development manager for EODEX. Um, I was quite keen to bring you in early because um, you, what you do um, has a lot to do with a big theme these days, which is sustainability. Um, we would love to know a little bit more about your solution. So I leave that to you, but also about your increase of US market share and why you decided to base yourself, if I read correctly in your press release here in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, Lee, over to you, good to have you and congratulations. Our team can probably unmute you unless, um, oh, just let us know, here we go. I think we got it, perfect. Fantastic, I think we're unmuted. Um, no, thanks very much, that's very kind. Uh, yeah, so I'm Lee Worsling from uh, EODEX. Um, um, our company specializes in the environmentally friendly disposal of bombs, and there is such a thing. Um, we were very much target sort of offshore wind farm tier one operators, um, because it's, um, you know, the, the traditional method of disposing of bombs um, in the offshore world is to make a big bang, destroy the seabed. Um, the whales and dolphins aren't particularly happy. It doesn't look very good for our client's reputation to make a big bang and do that sort of damage. So where we come in is to provide a unique product. We've got our own proprietary equipment, which um, it burns out the explosive from bombs. Um, and there's no, there's no sort of bang. We're just left with some scrap at the end and we, we remove that scrap. So uh, the company started in 2017 and it was based in Portsmouth uh, in the UK. And we've got an office in Aberdeen and um, not quite as exotic. We've also got an office in Bogda Regis uh, on the south coast. And it, recently, just in February, we, we opened an office in Portsmouth in Rhode Island, um, which is headed by our, our president of the US uh, department over there, uh, Andy Elvin. And he's currently, um, or he was teaching at the Naval Warfare College. So all of our guys are um, ex-military very knowledgeable when it comes to uh, the specialist sort of niche market of bomb disposal uh, and this sort of thing. Um, our decision to go to the US, it's a very much sort of a fledgling market. And as we're just sort of getting set up in the US, it was a key time for us to get in. Um, what we're finding at the moment is that uh, offshore operators and generally the supply chain in the US, they're not very familiar with UXO, of course, unlike in the UK and in Europe. We're very familiar with unexploded bombs, unexploded ordnance, um, legacy munitions, which are left from the Second World War. Um, we're very familiar with managing and mitigating against those uh, sort of things. But in the US, of course, that's not too much of a problem uh, historically. However, what we're finding, and we're in discussions with clients now, um, uh, there's, there's, sort of, there's firing ranges and um, exercise areas which um, offshore developers and wind farms they, they just didn't have a clue with it in the first place so that's that's very much our reason for launching in the us and we, we started out um just growing the company over there and already we've had a sort of tsunami of interest which is very flattering but it's also a lot to deal with <laughs> um as you'd appreciate yeah so that, that's sort of an overview of the company and, and where we're going amazing well thank you so much lee and congratulations you're you're a great example of if you have a specialized niche, niche product how you indeed can pinch into a large market such as the US. You know, often people tell you when you look at the US first, um, it's a large market, lots of competition, but it doesn't matter if you know what you're doing and if you can indeed, you know, if you have done a good market anal analysis and you know your product is comp um, competitive, it's really then about how to go into the market and you have clearly done that. So looking forward to, to your future growth. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I, another another company that actually didn't go to New York or San Francisco, and again, not that you shouldn't go there, but um, I, I was quite keen that we have a broad diversity of companies across the US is MAC Clinical Research. And Mark, Mark, I have you right in front of me, which is why I thought I'd bring you in right now. Um, based on your press release that our team picked up, you have announced a major expansion in the US um, also, um, and uh, a new office in Philadelphia. Um, a great, a great place where British American business also has a, a, a chapter, the British American uh, business uh, network chapter in Philadelphia. It would be great if, if we can learn about your company and your product and what brought you to Philadelphia. Um, I will tell you again later in a moment why I thought it was so interesting. But first of all, over to you, Mark. Yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, am I off mute? Yeah, good. Yeah, uh, so, yeah thank you very much. Um, yeah, our organization is uh, is clinical um, research development organization. So we've been working in the UK for 
so probably a history that goes back about to 1987, but we've been working over the last 20 years, um, developing drugs um, across the UK, across all phases of clinical development. Um, we, we started a very small number of staff. We've got about 350 people now working in the UK. Um, we have a, a phase one work, which is first into human sort of experimental work is based in um, one of the hospital complexes in, in, in Manchester, which is in the, the centre. Uh, and then we have centres all around the UK that go down as far as Birmingham and up as far as, as Newcastle. So we cover about 30 million of the population. And we work across a variety of different areas. So we, you know, our original origins were across CNS, which is central nervous system disorders, such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, for example. Um, but in the last um, few years, we've been working across about 42 different therapeutic areas. So most of our customers are... US-based global pharma, which we have master agreements with and, and biotechnology companies on mainly from East and West Coast. Um, so so they're, they're our customers. Our expansion is outside of the UK has been gradual. So we, we originally were doing a lot of work in the UK um, it, with, with, with subjects and patients in our centers. And uh, as we developed as a sort of a, a full service global CRO, we've, we've moved out. US is obviously the first port of call for us um, because most of our current clients who we work with in the UK want to run their programs that are, are going through various stages of drug development uh, in both Europe and the US. So we would have a presence in, in Europe uh, and US is, uh, is, is our next uh, step. So we've been employing staff now um, across the US in, uh, in, in, the, in the various roles to, to support ourselves in the, the programs that that we run um, across both US and, and, um, and Europe. Philadelphia, we have staff in Philadelphia. We go to Philadelphia, I'm there tomorrow actually, so we know Philadelphia very well. Um, yeah, we've looked around, so it won't be, it's, it's our first of many sites. We, um, we chose Philadelphia, uh, maybe because we go there a lot. We work with a lot of um, global pharma there. So yeah, as I said, we, we're familiar with Philadelphia. It's, uh, it's easy for us to access as well from, from the UK. And so, so uh, and we'll be fishing on the Delaware as well. So I can't say that influenced <laughs> our, uh, our decision, but uh, yeah, it, we, we, it's, it's only, it's the first of uh, a few centres and uh, we, you know, we will be opening them at other centres uh, this year and next year as we, as, as we invest. That's a sort of a summary of our organisation in, in, in a nutshell, I suppose. I mean, I wouldn't call you a small company. It's quite significant, you know, how you've grown and that you are now employing several hundred employees, which is really a big achievement. I think many, many around this virtual roundtable would, would agree here. And I think you also said something quite important, which is that, you know, obviously when you look at the US or the UK for that matter, but that will be subject for a different roundtable. You look at clusters, you know, where do certain clusters sit for healthcare, automotive or others. But even more importantly, and I think that your story reflects that quite well, is you look for existing customers and where do they sit? And then you build your business around them, which you have clearly done. But it's good to see that you have actually lots to choose from because one of the big questions we always get asked, and uh, I'm, I'm sure our colleagues from the US Embassy, Brenda and her colleagues will agree, is, you know, where do I even go? But what we often say is, well, depends on where your customers or where your, where your main audience is. Um, same would be, you know, Jerry, um, you know, bikes are very popular but maybe not everywhere in the US so you need to look into you know where where are bike stores where's an audience that that will will be interested in the uh, and, and create a demand in your products um so um well done congratulations and again as I said we look forward to having you and please uh, get, given that I see you know more and more company leaders come in here um, please use the chance to network and use it as a peer-to-peer -peer network either during the event or afterwards. Speaking of which, um, I have now Connie Moser uh, in, in front of me on the screen, who is the CEO of Nav Navenio. Um, speaking of clusters, Oxford, I'm not surprised. We have once been to Oxford indeed to learn more about the health and pharmaceutical cluster there. Um, the reason why I think our team picked you up, well done on this one, is among others, because you secured uh, a 12.6 million, I think that's official, isn't it, investment um, to accelerate your growth. And I'm always so fascinated by that because um, that the companies go out and, 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 and secure such a large amount of investment. Um, so I would, we would really be interested in, in you know, what was the process behind it when you decide to go out into the market and find an investor? And what is it that uh, you want to do with the money? 
um, as it as it pertains to your US expansion. Connie, over to you, and thanks for having, uh, thanks for coming in, and congratulations. Well, thank you for allowing me to give you a little bit of um, flavor of Nevenio. Nevenio is an indoor mapping and workflow company where we've initially focused out. Uh, in the healthcare industry. And uh, the technology, we've got about 17 patents going for our 18th, is embedded experiential mapping and workflow. It's almost like Uber indoors is an easy way to explain it for healthcare. So think about movement around a healthcare system and how, how often hospitals in the structure, the interior of the healthcare system structure changes. And being able to do that continuous experiential map and then allowing layering on top of it workflow that allows a patient transporter, for example, to pick up a task because he or she is the closest, has the right skill set, and can service that patient in the quickest manner possible with outcomes being higher patient experience. Um, higher levels of satisfactions for the clinicians on the floor because they can track where that person is that is providing the service and then higher capacity and throughput in the health system, which decreases overall costs across the health system. So this patent has been, the, or these patents and this innovative technology, we have just started to bring it into the UK. We're pretty well, well founded. We got an NHSX award and are putting it into about 15 trusts, but the money was um, sought after for US expansion. And as you can tell, I'm probably the first one that doesn't have the UK accent. They looked for a US CEO. So I joined the company in January of this year exclusively to focus on expansion in the U.S. So we have begun to do that. And we are looking at not only direct to healthcare, but partnerships within the U.S. healthcare system that focus on patient flow and patient movement across the health system. So really excited to be able to further develop this solution with the money, um, the gracious amount of money that our investors and our equity holders have provided us. Um, excited to move forward. So we've begun conversations. We have many, many conversations moving. We have started to hire both a U, uh, US based sales force that has experience specifically in this space and also a professional services team to be able to deliver the services to control costs as well. So very, very excited about our movement into the US and I am based in Nashville, Tennessee. So we've got a mid, uh, mid US uh, secondary office in Tennessee, but we're based out of Oxford, England. Amazing, and on that note, by the way, um, you know, British American business has uh, a network across the US and across the UK not in Nashville, Tennessee, but our colleagues will be in Nashville this week um, to meet a number of businesses and business leaders. If you don't know about it yet, let me know, because we would be happy to connect you there, because there is indeed a, a, a high demand in, I wouldn't even call it a regionalized approach, because, you know, these are sometimes economies on their own. But um, it's really important to indeed have more and more hubs across the US and across the UK where we are present and visible, which is why, again, part of our team will travel to Nashville this week to meet um, people on the ground. We'd be very happy to connect you. Um, that would I be stay, wonderful. Great, fantastic. And uh, I, I stay with you, uh, well, at least with, with, your, with your process behind it, because I just saw that we have another company who went through a funding process, um, which is Paragraph. And... Uh, Charles Platt, who's the CFO there, I, I see you now on my screen also. Um, you also uh, uh, secured a quite a significant amount of money for your expansion. Um, in addition to your product and process, what would be, would be interesting to us is that you are active in at least three markets already, um, in addition to the US, UK, EU, and Asian markets. So if you just wanted to give us a couple, a couple of notes on you know, how do the, these markets compare and where does the UK, US corridor sit within, within your market exposure. Charles, good to have you. Congratulations and over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yes, so you're right. We have uh, recently secured quite a large amount of funding. We've got $60 million funding for our Series B, um, which, uh, which we completed about eight weeks ago, um, including direct investment from two US venture capital, um, well, uh, 
uh, investors as well, which is probably given a boost to our US our US plans because um, they're certainly very keen on us uh, expanding more in the US. Um, just a quick introduction. So, Paragraph, we are we are the, our core technology is graphing. Um, we are a graphene manufacturing company, um, but rather than just selling manufacturing and selling graphene, we put that into electronic devices. Um, and so we have one product at the moment, which is a product that we can actually sell, which is a magnetic sensor um, using graphene and harnessing graphene's unique properties um, to give our sensors some unique property, properties compared to other magnetic sensors out in the market. Um, and then at the same time, we're also developing a diagnostic, uh, medical diagnostic uh, sensor. And following on from that, there will be further solid state and logic uh, products in the pipeline. Um, we are very much obviously in our infancy, especially our expansion into the US. Um, the, the company is only four years old. Um, we're up to about 75 people now. And our expansion wow. into the US is, is happening right now. So we are, we are recruiting our first people into the US. And uh, we just completed interviews on that last week and hopefully hoping to make an appointment this week. Um, as far as, uh, and as you said, we are active in the UK, US and Asia. Um, we're based in the UK because that's where our, te our technology was invented, basically. As yeah. far as our markets are concerned, it's the US and it's Asia. Um, I was recently at some, uh, another event and they described uh, expanding and exporting into other markets as a, as a choice. And for us, it's not. Um, our biggest markets will be the US and they will be Asia because the end markets for our product are um, automotive um, for the sensors, um, which obviously huge bases in the US and Asia, um, but also medical as well. And the US market is probably not easy, but it's, it's a more of a market probably open to more new, new developments um, in, in some of the diagnostic stuff that we'll be doing. So it's certainly a place where we'll be basing ourselves and doing a lot of focus for our, for our US market, for our, for our medical diagnostics as well. Um, so, the US is, is a hugely important market to us because that's where a lot of our end customers are going to be. And it's actually where we're already seeing a lot of the big inquiries coming from the US. A lot of the small technical research is coming all the way from around the world, but the big ones, the big potential partnerships with automotive companies, et cetera, big sensor manufacturers is coming from the US um, as well as Asia as well. So it's, it's not a choice to us. We have to expand into the US. And that's why we're doing that now and, and establishing, first of all, commercial team. So that's what our... Yeah. US structure is going to be initially is just is, is the commercial team and they will be based wherever the right people are. It's, it's not looking to base it next to a particular customer at this stage or anything like that. It's basing where the right people are. Um, as that further develops, we will then do base. We will have to have different um, locations depending on which team we're looking at. So if it's the sensor team, they'd probably be based more likely near an automotive cluster, whereas, whereas the diagnostics team, they're going to be on the East Coast somewhere close to the medical uh yeah med tech uh sort of clusters as well so it's going to depend on which part of the u.s market we're actually attacking yeah. which product we're talking about well this is exactly why we love you know would love to listen to someone like you for more than just a few minutes because you know we can just learn so much and isn't it i see a number of you nodding here on my on my screen isn't it great that we actually have a round table where we have the majority of people representing actual businesses who are currently in an ex expansion process you know sometimes i go to events even even organized by 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 other partners who sit in the space you know that are about us expansion and you would only find two or three colleagues who are actually doing it right now here the majority of of, of colleagues around the room are doing it um which makes this conversation so valuable so again as i mentioned to you we lo would lo love to be a partner for you down the line and congratulations to your nomination and um good to have you i'm jumping a little bit we have 20 minutes left about 20 minutes left and i want to squeeze at least another four or so in and i'm jumping because um i'm not sure um whether um Radmila Blaszewka from security hq i don't know whether i was told that you had to jump off a few minutes early and i want to avoid losing you um and you have also another colleague on the call so i thought okay i bring you in right now um for you business um I will leave to you to explain um, what the business does. Um, but again, congratulations. And the one question that I have in addition to your product and your expansion plan is that you've gone to New York. Um, so there's a reason to go to New York. Would be interested to know what the reason was for you. And maybe on a slightly funny or not funny note is, you know, did you already find office space? Did you actually find, you know, get your feet on the ground? Because what we were told by our partners in the network is that New York is a very difficult market these days, very expensive and very hard to find space. Um, but um, Lord Miller, over to you. Good to have you in congratulations. Thanks, Emmanuel. And um, 
obviously um, really delighted to be pa part of this panel discussion. I had to jump in for my colleague who had a family emergency. Um, so uh, Security HQ, we are a global managed security service provider uh, and we've been in the market for over 15 years. Um, I'm, I'm calling from our London uh, SOC uh, at the moment, as you can see in the background. Um, we have about six uh, different uh, offices around the world. Um, however, since November last year, it's our first time that we've opened an office in, um, in New York. Uh, we've had um, custom, US customers for many years. And for us, it was a natural expansion to, um, to open a security operations center and a data center in, um, in US. Since, um, and yes, funny <laughs> to say that we, we had found an office. Um, our colleague, Samantha, who is also on the, on the call, uh, is running the, the office there with um, a few colleagues that we've um, hired and we're expanding the team uh, really massively and rapidly in the US. Uh, apart from our existing cust US customer base, we've had quite a lot of interest uh, from um, partners and as well as um, direct customers. As a cybersecurity, uh, obviously managed security serv service provider, we're very industry agnostic, which means we can um, serve and provide services to any business out there. Um, and as you already know, in the last few years, the cyber threats have been expected. It has really been a massive threat to any industry out there. So um, like for us, I guess that means that uh, the market is uh, expanding. And for us, the US market is very uh, rapidly growing. Uh, we've had quite a lot of interest from new um, prospects and customers. But obviously for us is uh, very interesting to be part of the um, uh, tech events. And as well as um, we've, um, we've been very delighted to be part, part of this um, discussion as well and run table. Um, and as well as as a um, as is New York was um, mainly chosen because of the East Coast, where we have few already U.S. customers that are present there. And for a security provider, uh, for us, it meant that we have to have our foot on the ground. Fantastic, makes good sense. But also, again, a great reflection of how much demand there is right now. It seems to be a lot of demand in the US for UK products and services, which of course, you know, we couldn't ask for anything better. Now it's the question, how can we deliver behind this as quickly as possible? And uh, great you made it work, great that you are opened in, in New York and that you can service your customers accordingly. As I mentioned, we have 50 minutes left and I will squeeze in as many colleagues as I can um, because we have indeed a very large group of fantastic colleagues and companies here. Um, maybe kicking off, if, if, if Adam Prickett is, is on the call, CEO of Ablearn, because I thought, here we go, I see you right away, because I thought we switch um, sectors and industries a little bit and have you you come in. Um, you've also um, secured funding for expansion. Um, you said you would create up to 60 new jobs in the US. Um, I think you already have offices there in the US. So it would be just generally interesting for us to see where are you right now in the journey and where do you hope to be in a, in a couple of years from now? Adam, over to you from Ablon. Sure. Hi there from uh, probably not so sunny Manchester, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, um, here at AppLearn, we are a B2B uh, software business. So we have a SaaS platform, which is known as a digital adoption platform. Uh, and effectively, it's a, a cloud-based solution that enables organizations to increase the use utilization of applications. So SaaS applications that uh, all organizations really use across the business. We help to drive a successful software experience. Uh, we do that via in-app uh, guidance support and producing relevant content in the flow of work so that we can get the employees to be a bit more um, efficient and effective when using the application. So we've, we've kind of been a, a SaaS software business now for five, six plus years, uh, and we kind of always operated in the US. So we're very much headquartered here in Manchester in the UK, but we've had, uh, we've serviced customers over in, in the US for that time. We, I would say over 50% of our revenue now comes from the US and Canada. Um, we we did take some investment, as you mentioned, uh, just over two years ago now from a West Coast uh, PE uh, organization in, uh, in in Los Angeles called K1. Yeah. So that's helped us expand on the ground really over there. So we've got a Boston office uh, where we have uh, some sales employees. 
and we're really looking to to grow that over over the next few years and grow our our feet on the ground we find due to the nature of our products and the markets we can find customers and sell to customers in the US from the UK, but it is a lot more efficient once, you, once you're down on the ground, especially now things are opening up a lot more um, from a COVID perspective and you can yeah. do a lot more face-to-face -face meetings. So as uh, uh, Rory touched on it earlier on in the meeting, uh, when the, uh, the borders opened up, we were on one of the first flights over to LA uh, back in November last year and our VP of sales is actually uh, in the air at the moment. It should be landing in New York anytime soon. So. We are getting back and forth to try and get out there and, uh, and, and see more and more customers, but we're using that investment really to, to expand uh, and, and grow our uh, employee and customer base in the US because the market is, is just huge for us in the software space. Amazing. We're so overwhelmed by all this, you know, demand and positivity coming from the US. You're absolutely right. I think being on the ground matters. Um, what we have learned also is that you can do a lot of prep work. Um, virtually which i think is great and i think bab right now tries to do build a lot of platforms where you can save hopefully a lot of time by meeting people virtually before you then plan your trip but you're absolutely right once you have identified your customers once you know where you're wanting to go and you need to be in person and it's good that we have more and more colleagues coming coming to the us it would be actually interesting to see the numbers my guess would be there are still more uk companies on the plane flying to the us than the other way around but um, our colleagues from united delta or other uh, airlines on the on the call will be able to tell us um I would like to st stick to tech for, for a moment. Um, a, because we have two fintech companies on, on, on the call, um, but also because tech has a specific role these days when it comes to UK, US expansion and vice versa. Two uh, quick uh, facts on that or on information on that. Um, the other way around may be more relevant for our next call, but the US embassy is actually together with the government in Washington DC, organizing a FinTech mission from the US to the UK. Um, could be interesting to some of us um, to make contacts and we can share information after this call or in the chat right now. And secondly, um, I mentioned the Select USA Summit earlier, which will take place in Washington DC late June. It has a tech focus and um, a number of sessions are specifically for tech companies and I also know, I don't know whether we have now passed the deadline, but I think there was also a large discount for 10 companies who wanted to attend the summit. Um, if you're interested in the summit, get in touch with us afterwards. We don't have time right now to go into details, but it's worth looking at. Speaking of tech, um, Byte Investments is on the call. I think Charlie von Moll, head of Europe, is with us. If I'm not mistaken, I think he should show up in a moment. Um, Emma, you can tell me whether, because my screen has just changed. Hi there. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Here we go. Perfect. I'm um, great. Um, you're president of Americas. That means that you're based in the US. Is that is that correct? Say again. Sorry. Can you just repeat that. You had you're you're named president of Americas for the company. So that means that you're based in the US. Or are you doing it out of out of the UK? Uh, we are actually doing it um, 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 mainly out of the US. That's right. Although we do have offices in the UK and Hong Kong as well, but um, the US is certainly where we see as the uh, our focus and the uh, uh, and the biggest and most immediate uh, area of growth. Yeah. So tell us very briefly about your product. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, alternative investments and maybe also what that would mean for you personally, because I, if you have that title already, does that mean that you will be full time in the US one day? Just a few comments on your product and yourself. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the product is. Um, it's a SaaS software focused on the alternative investment industry, uh, and it is software for um, fundraising and investor management with regards to alternatives. When we think about alternatives, we're really mainly thinking about sort of private equity, private credit, real estate, that kind of thing. So um, it, 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 essentially, when you know fundraising into alternatives has historically been a you know very manual, very 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 um, labor intensive, uh, cost intensive uh, process. It's all been offline. It's all been about sending PDFs back and forth and emails going to junk boxes, um, and 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 lots of signatures in the wrong places and duplication of information, etc. And a lot of this is because you know there's a lot of KYC involved, a lot of AML involved, um, and, and you have to be very very clear about who it is that you're sort of marketing or you're onboarding these the, the, these investors into. So we have um, uh, uh, you know our parent company has been raising. Um, 
capital uh, globally from both institutions and high net worth um, globally for over 10 years. And during that time, we sort of developed this technology in order to solve our own problems and make our own processes more efficient. Um, and in so doing, you know, we we had a lot of people, you know, come up to us and say, oh, wow, you know, that tech's great. You know, that tech's great. We, we need that tech because we're struggling with, you know, struggling with very old fashioned processes, very inefficient processes. And, and, and frankly, we just need the tech. We need to digitize. We need to modern, we need to modernize and we need to make our uh, um, make our processes more efficient uh, for investors. So. We develop that technology. It's a SaaS technology, and uh, and essentially, it's very powerful. Um, and when we look at the addressable market, the US is uh, it, it's it's you know it's five ten years in terms of the alternatives and the size of the alternatives market, and this and in terms of how the US guys think about um, adopting digital processes, it's five or ten years ahead of of, of maybe Europe or or, or Asia. So. It's a very, as well as being sort of 10 times the size. So it's a lot bigger. Um, they're a lot more, uh, a lot more ready to adapt to this kind of technology. And, you know, they've got the market and the demand there for it as well. So it's really the obvious place uh, for, for us to be growing. Amazing. And when you say SaaS technology, you mean the SaaS software of the US company based out of Raleigh, Cary, um, which, I'm, which I'm happy to see this week, by the way. Um, um, a great company and hopefully also a good partner for British American business going forward. We have only six minutes left. So let me copy something that the Select USA Summit in June will do, which is almost like a mini pitch session, because I would love for us to hear from three more colleagues at least before we wrap up and tell you about, among others, the exciting reception that our team in London is currently planning. Um, I was quite keen if, if, if so, if Newman is here, US Managing Director for Capital, Capital and Tap to come in first, I also wanted to see whether Michael Shen, uh, founder and CEO of Nuclear, is there. And then at least um, if, if we have someone, I think Canvas 8 has just joined also. If we have someone, Samuel, I see you now on my on the screen. If we maybe have the three of you, almost like in a one minute pitch, um, just to tell us, you know, what is it you do and what's currently happening and why did we find you on our list before we then slowly wrap up the session and bring it to a close. Let's start with Capital and Tap. Zoe. Hi, thanks, Manuel. Um, yeah, so my name is Zoe. I'm the um, US Managing Director for Capital on Tap. Um, we are a small business credit card company based in the UK and, and started there in 2012. Um, and we launched into the US in around March 2021. Um, and so kind of trying to sell best in class small business credit cards to SMBs over here. Um, we've launched in Atlanta, so we've got our, our operation site right. and, and team based in Atlanta, which is a really great city, much sunnier than London, so uh, it's nice to be out here. I moved over in February um, and uh, really just kicking off the, the US business. Um, we've had kind of a ton of interest, a lot of demand for our card, um, and I'm really trying to, to build the best product for SMBs over here. A great product, and we know lots of good people in Atlanta, so if you still need to make friends over there, down there, in fact, uh, let us know, and you're indeed very lucky with the weather. It's not very much fun these days on the East Coast. Michael, thanks so much for coming in. Nuclear, over to you. Uh, it just so happens Atlanta's my hometown, so uh, it's a wonderful... Nice to have friends. Uh, it, 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 friends. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have barbecue at Fat Matt's in Atlanta one of these days. Um, so I'm Michael Chan, co-founder, CEO of Nuclear, a company based here in Cambridge, UK. Uh, we make proteins accessible. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, proteins are the building blocks of uh, drug discovery, and we effectively make that accessible through our 3D printer th uh, for proteins. Uh, and uh, we are a startup. We started as uh, three people at the beginning of 2019. Uh, received uh, just over $80 million of total investment uh, into Nuclera from both UK and US investors. And the reason why we've expanded uh, to the United States is because we've had long-term strategic partnership with a company called E-Ink. Uh, they are responsible for making this, the e-paper technology that goes into every single Amazon Kindle. Uh, and other uh, products, uh, display products. And it turns out that if you use the uh, display technology here, you can make biology accessible through microfluidic technologies. And so we get these directly from the display supply chain uh, in order to make 
bio cartridges uh, to automate the protein accessibility workflow for drug discovery applications. Uh, so it's a, 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 absolutely wonderful. If you want to check us out, visit nuclera.com. Uh, we expanded to Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, absolutely amazing. And before I forget, please be in touch afterwards if you wanted to, because one thing that's not very official yet, but the US and the UK government will want to hold, hold their next small and growing business dialogue meeting in Boston, um, where a lot of interesting and important people will travel to Boston. It would be a great network there, and it would be obviously, I think, quite yeah. relevant for you to play yeah. a role there if you don't know yet already. And, and maybe just a little selfish thing, if any of the airline people, if they want to do a Stansted to Boston flight, that would be absolutely wonderful. Okay, well, we do a competition who wants to come in first on, on that, that idea in the chat. Thank you so much, Michael, for, have, uh, for being in. Okay, I was, we are on time, two more minutes. Um, so one minute to Canvas 8, Sam, for you, and then one minute for me to wrap up. It's a tight ending. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, so I'm Sam, I'm the strategy director at Canvas 8. We're a strategic insight firm uh, specializing in understanding human behavior and culture uh, and helping audience based, uh, clients basically understand their audiences better. Uh, we have two products, two services. One is uh, a membership platform, which runs like a SaaS business, and the other is sort of consultancy, which is an award-winning consultancy where, again, we help clients sort of stay on top of new trends. Uh, we launched in the US. Uh, we're completely independent, no funding. We launched in the US in 2017 uh, in, in New York and LA, because that's where our clients and our market is. Um, and it's been pretty transformative for us, actually. Um, only about 15% of our headcount was in the US, but about 50% of our subscription revenues and 65% of our consultancy revenues are in the US now. So yeah, it's been very good for us. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And uh, let me just, before I wrap up, uh, acknowledge companies that are also on the call but didn't have the chance to speak today, maybe on a future occasion. I have Ocarion here, Simply Pay Me, Unipod Logistics, I saw you, Boyd, Greenstone, and Power Photonic. Apologies if I've missed anyone else. Um, another information that I just wanted to re-emphasize is that our colleague from the US Embassy just said on the, in the chat that the applications, for, the special applications for tech companies to attend the Select USA Summit are still open. So uh, feel free to get in touch with Brenda or one of us in our, uh, one of us in our team if you wanted to, uh, to take advantage of that. Okay, what can I say? That was good fun. Um, thank you so much to all of the companies, their representatives for having joined us today and for sharing your stories. Um, for those who uh, listened in, um, I'm, I'm sure you are quite intrigued. Um, if you're intrigued, feel free to also join us in one of our next sessions that are coming up. And as I said, mentioned earlier, there will be a reception in London on the 7th of July. And I'm just looking at my colleague, Emma, whether she is nodding 7th of July in London. She may have even shared the information right now for you to come together in person. We have heard it before. It is important to come in together in person. So please feel free to use this opportunity. This um, invitation is open to members of the BAB network, but also members who are part of the wider tag and accelerate network. Um, so you have the details there. Um, I can just say it's really encouraging to hear your stories and it's really encouraging that you really reflect what we hope to hear, which is that the US is indeed in a, a very important and continues to be a very important market. I've said this numerous times, feel free to use it as a friend and ally, whether it be for barbecue in Atlanta or for us connecting to the, the embassy or um, the British government or any of our partners here who help you turn your ambition into reality. I think I have done my bit. Um, let me just say a big thanks to HSBC Delta and Virgin Atlantic for supporting and sponsoring this series and for making a contribution here. And in a way, the biggest things that I have to say is to the team, Alice, um, Emma, Sophie, and others who you know spend 12 months every year going through lots of news clippings to find you. Um, I hope that we can really turn this into a large community and continue to be part of your growth story. Um, I think I've done my part. It was good to see you all. It was great that we had so many colleagues listening and that was good fun, as I mentioned, and we look forward to seeing you very soon again.